being a racist is bad. In fact, even the most overt racists out there will tell you they are not racist. They are merely protecting some ideal. They are defending their right to exist as white people. And well, if you call that racist, then maybe you're the one being racist. For the rest of us who aren't waving around swastikas and Confederate flags and the like, we're quick to say we're also not racist. But is not being racist enough? As a society and as human beings, do we owe it to each other to go beyond that? In this episode of The Uncomfortable Truth, we're going to explore just that. This is Loki Mulholland, and it's time to get uncomfortable. We're joined today by a freedom writer and civil rights activist, Luvon Brown. Hello, Luvon. How you doing? Hi, Loki. How are you? I'm doing good. How's, how's life uh, in New York with this coronavirus and everything going on? Well, that's the problem. You know, it, I, I think I told you that when they were talking about old people, I realized they were talking about me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so. I, I told you that several episodes ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. So. So, so, you know, given the general view of what racism is in America amongst whites, you know, like we said, you know, you're going to be hard pressed to find a white person who says they they are racist. Again, this is based on the general idea that you know racists are bad and burn crosses and those sort of things. But um, when we were shooting the Uncomfortable Truth, the film, the Uncomfortable Truth, you you said something to me during your interview about uh, people, you know, not perceiving themselves as being racist. It's that. Um, no one likes to think of themselves as being an SOB. Well, no one does. I mean, I think the problem that we have is that um, the word has taken on such a, um, what's the word? There's a, like a, there's a psychological thing about racist. They don't, you know, we're brought up not to think that the racists are those people who uh, burn flags, and they don't want a president, they don't want, you know, but there's more to it than that. And I think people, once they accept that there's more to it than that, there's behaviors, there's attitudes, uh, maybe then they can turn to being helpful and get a little bit all together. Right. Uh, but what's, what's happening is that uh as black people discover that so much has gone on, they want to talk to white people about it, but they don't want to do it uh, without saying a word, and that word happens to be racist. And that doesn't mean that uh, you know, once you say that, that you're talking about, first of all, that you're talking about that person, but you're talking about an attitude. You're talking about something that happens. You're talking about the way you live. And you don't very often get a chance to say that because as soon as you say racist, the what the person that you're talking to, the white person, says, "Well, I'm not racist. I have black friends. Uh, we had a black president. We had whatever." You well, know? It, yeah. Well, it's interesting because according to a Pew Research Center study in 2019. Uh, a lot of people recognize that racism is a problem in America. 50%, 56% of whites think so, while 71% of African Americans think racism is an issue. Right. Um, let's be clear, this, this is not, when we're talking about racism, we're not talking about you know the white people being treated poorly by people of color, but people of color being treated poorly by whites, of course. So, right. so a, a good number of whites think uh it's a problem while 44% think all oh, this is overblown. But no matter which side of the fence you would sit on, neither neither person in that group would tell you that they're racist. Racism exists, but it's just not them. Right. They can always point to someone else, but they can never actually identify themselves in this equation. Because they are of the opinion that they know what racism is. See, most... Most white people, black people either for that matter, but certainly not white people, know what racism is. What I mean by that is they don't realize that many white people come from a, a, a position of privilege. And mm-hmm. that doesn't mean they own a lot, they have a lot. That just means that they function in society different than, say, I do. Right. Or not, you know. And we're going to leave class out of this for now. Sure. But 
but I think I don't know how you change that. You know, it's it's so racism is a is a is a way of thinking. It's a way of, and we're all way, we're all raised with that thinking that says, mm-hmm. "I'm white, I can do whatever." But if you talk to a white person, you say racist, they say, "Wait a minute, they're talking about me." Right, and they're they're gonna put me down. The next thing I know, they're gonna be beating on me because right. I'm a racist. So or I know what a racist is, and I'm not it. Right. So then you tell them, well, wait a minute, because if you have this attitude, or, or or you think of me a certain way because I'm black, or you you watch me because I'm black, or you do whatever, all of that is a form of racism. So how do you stop that? Well, right. you tell the kids. I really think that much of this starts with the kids, that you tell them, wait a minute, my doing X is racist behavior. I don't want you doing that. Right. And the the history of the impact of that racist behavior, the history of that. So in in this, again, in this uh, Pew Research Center study in in 2019, uh, the, the gap widens even further when you start to analyze the impact of, of a racist past on today. So 58% of whites think the legacy of slavery has played a role on the position of blacks in American society. 84% of blacks will tell you it has. And if we're, uh, if we're being graded on this in school, the gulf of recognition is a, is an F to a B. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's pretty extreme. It is. I think because they're leaving out the, at 50, what do you say, 54%? 50, 58%. 58% is leaving out uh, behaviors and the psych- psychological impact of what racism has done. What I, by that I mean, so if I tell you that so-and-so got lynched back in 1836 or 46 or 56, and that lynching was purely because the person was black. The white person, the average white person, that 58%, is going to say, I'm sorry that happened. Right. That shouldn't have happened. And then all of a sudden, they don't realize that I'm still carrying that. Uh, That 84% is still carrying that. That 58% is still carrying that. So they don't realize that what I'm telling them is, I know that they didn't do that. They didn't do the lynching, but that they need to tell their kids, or they themselves need to change and say, not only am I sorry about that, but I'm going to make sure that never happens again. Well, yeah. And and, and so there's 58% who recognize that the legacy of slavery has played a role on the position of Black American society. Um it's this interesting sort of thing that happens, though. It's like, so if you told that same story and you said it was your great grandfather who was lynched, and and uh, they took all of his land, and my family went into you know into poverty and so forth, and and that my dad was ostracized, and he couldn't get a job, which meant I couldn't go to school. When you put it on a personal level, you know th- th- they can recognize that, but when you start talking about this broader stuff, um. I seem to start to glaze over a little bit. Well, they recognize that it affects me. Right. They don't recognize that it's a systemic problem. Right. They don't they don't understand how so it, it might have been a, it might have been an individual thing, but they don't recognize that it was the entire town, county, right. state, right, federal government that was allowing this to happen. Right. And very often was the the perpetrator, right? Uh, that they don't see that. That's the part that they're missing. Yeah. That I'm not just talking about me and my grandfather. I'm talking in general. When I go to the general, I lose them, right? Because as soon as I do that, it takes away it the ability to feel sorry about me. And then the next thing they figure I'm going to say is I'm going to blame them, which is not what's going to happen. Right. What what what's going to happen is I'm going to explain to them why black people are now acting the way they're acting, mm-hmm. or why why they're accusing the system of doing X. 
My work has taken me to a lot of places and I've been fortunate to meet some incredible people. But when I came to Selma and met Joanne Blackman Bland, I knew I was in the presence of greatness. Joanne was 11 years old when she was attacked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday in 1965. She wasn't old enough to vote, but understood its importance enough to be there. After Selma is an in-depth look at how our right to vote has eroded since the signing of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the fight for the right to vote continues. Get informed. You can find After Selma on Amazon Prime or visit LokiMulholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. So when asked if the country has gone far enough in giving blacks equal rights, equal rights with whites, um, 63% of whites will tell you we've done enough. While only 22% of blacks will say that, that we've done a good job. And when you start to really dig into the numbers of why whites and blacks are clearly not on the same page, a lot of it comes back to how each group perceives the issues of how blacks are treated differently than whites. And tipping off into that, medical standpoints, when seeking medical treatment, uh, the, the, the gap is 26% um, to, 50, to 59%. That, there, that, that, that these days, blacks are treated less fairly than whites. So 26% will tell you, well, blacks are getting less treated less fairly than whites when it comes to medical treatment, whereas 59% of African Americans are saying, ah, no, we're not getting treated fairly at all. So you have this 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 contrast all the way down. Yeah. Um, hiring, loans and mortgages, stores and restaurants, you know, police treatment, you know, elect, you know, voting, right? Um wherein uh whites really aren't seeing that this is really taking place. They'll say racism exists again. Uh, they'll say they're not the ones that are racist. But at the end of the day, um, the contrast that exists there is striking. Um, now, let me let me let me add to that. Uh, you know, because at the root of the point of this podcast is uh, today is the gap between whites and blacks on the question of whether black people in America will eventually have equal rights. Okay, right. Only seven percent of whites thought that's ever going to happen. Only how many? Seven percent. Right. Seven, if you ask, 7% of whites will actually say, yeah, you know what, eventually African Americans are going to have the same rights as whites. But 50% of blacks think that eventually they will, which I thought was interesting. And I wonder if that's because huh. we're becoming a browner country and that whites are you know, becoming a smaller portion of the population. Perhaps that plays into it. But, I mean, if you recognize there's a problem, but you don't think it's going to get any better, I mean, what, what does that even mean? I mean, because yet systemic racism was created by, maintained by, and continued by individuals working collectively, right? I mean, unconsciously for the most part. Right. And so part of the solution individually is to be the solution. So if you believe you are not racist, but, you know, but that only goes so far. I mean, it's not enough to not be racist. You must be against racism. Right. Actively but, but, well, against racism. The, the, the problem is you have to be able to recognize it, though. In other right. words, so let's say I go into, and, and the problem now, no, first of all, now we get into uh, location and class, because mm -hmm. it, it does play a role. It, it, so the, the, the way I live, a black person who went into the hospital may be treated differently than they would be in Georgia. Right. Uh, Alabama or any any one of those states or Pennsylvania for that matter, parts of Pennsylvania. If you're in Philadelphia, you may be treated all right. If you're in Pittsburgh, you may be treated all right. If you're outside of the city, maybe not so much. Right. Uh, because it's the same people that are given medical treatment that have given you, that have done everything else. So right. it depends on where you are. So what you, the problem with, with polls or not is that the poll, the Pew poll, is done all over the country. Mm -hmm. So 7% uh, of white people say nothing's ever going to change. Well, things have already changed, and things will no, continue no, no, to no. change. 7% so think things... 
will not change. On the question of whether black people in America will eventually have rights, only 7% of whites thought that was ever going to happen. Right. I mean, that's pretty and pessimistic. I, that is. Only, only 7% believe that something was going to, that things would change. So 90, 93% were saying, nah, this ain't ever going to change. Right. But they're saying, they're saying something else. They're saying, because we ain't going to let them. They don't realize they're saying that, but that's what they're saying. Every time you talk, you talk about black people, you talk about crime, you talk about uh, they want something, they're going to get something, they're going to take something from you. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is everybody's being forced to fight for their piece of the pie. And it depends. Uh, things, things are changing. They change back. They change. So we had Barack Obama. We're going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're paying for it now. Uh, but that may change. I mean, I, even in your neighborhood, I ran right. into a black guy that's running a, a business that's mostly white people, but Utah is mostly white people. And he says he's doing fine. Yeah. Right? Now, now right. why is he doing fine? He's doing fine because people have decided his food's good, they're going to come in. Right. But so, but coming back around to this thing of, of so I'm a white person. And I say, I'm not racist. Okay, well, congratulations, right? Right. But uh, if, if, if I'm going to take that stand and say that I'm not, do I have a, a responsibility uh, to, to, you know, to, to stand up against, you know, to stand against racism? Because it's not just, an, to me, I'm looking at I think you, point. I think you do. I think the white person... He has to. Again, I'm going to go back to we're 12% of the population, black people. 12, 13, somewhere in there, between 12 and 13%, right? Mm -hmm. And the country is, is, is where, it, it's where it is now, but you need the white person to realize that I'm not going to rape people, I'm not going to kill people, I'm not going to rob people. Right. I want to be a member of society. Now, you can stand in my way or not. So just saying things and acting differently is not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. And your child is going to grow up in, a, in an environment where I may be his boss. Right. Uh, are you going to still tell me tell him that you know I, nobody's a racist or I'm not a racist? You can't do that. You you put you're putting him at, or him or her at a disadvantage. So. Sit, look at yourself and say, I am this way because. Right. And that's okay. You, you can say that. But then you have to say that to your neighbor. You have to say that to your children. Mm -hmm. You have to not act on this impulse to do things that are racist. Right. That's hard. And so it's not, enough it. to, it's not enough to merely say that, you know, I'm not racist. I mean, that, is not, no. that doesn't give you a carte blanche. It's just like, okay, well, I can detach myself from society now. You can't, because you have to tell the next guy. Because when you identify yourself, you are, you know, for where you stand, then you need to stand on that principle. Right. And 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 by the way, so now you don't say anything. You just say, I'm not racist, right? So your kid does something that, you, that I think is racist, and I tell you about it. What are you going to do? Yeah. Say so that's not racist? Well, you can't say that. I just told you it was. In my other life, I'm a filmmaker, and one of my more fascinating films I created is the award-winning film titled Black, White, and Us. It's about viewing racism through the lens of transracial adoptions in Utah. Utah? Yeah, Utah. It just so happens to be the transracial adoption capital of the world. So what happens when white families who didn't believe racism existed anymore adopts a black child? Find it on Amazon Prime, or visit LokiMalholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. But clearly, from the from the from the studies and so forth, the idea of racism in of itself, there's there's a contrast there. So, of what you perceive as being racist and what I believe is racist. So, for me to say I'm not racist is typically just saying, well, look, I'm not burning crosses. 
right. not running around using the N word and those sort of things. Right. So, Hey, I'm, I'm okay. You can't define the problem is the white person can't define it. So, so right. But it's, yeah, you can't define, you know, I, I can't tell you if something hurts you. Right. 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 You can't, you can't do that. But is me saying I'm not racist my way of really kind of ignoring the issues? Now, because no, no. I've already, def- I've, well, I've defined it for myself saying, hey, I'm not racist. So, you know, is that, is that my way of not recognizing that racist things aren't happening? That racist thing, excuse me. Is that, is that my way of, of saying that racist things are happening? Well, let me know why actually, well not happening, I should say. You know what I'm getting at. It's your way of no. I don't think is it you're a, trying is to it get, a coping mechanism. I don't, I don't think you're trying to get away from anything, but you're just trying to say uh, I, it keeps me from doing anything about it. If I decide that uh, I don't like racism, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not racist, uh, even though it's a racist system out there. Uh, but I'm going to live my life as a right. as a as a non-racist person. Well, so. Yeah, that's so what see, you're taught. Right, right. So I see, you know, so I I, I run around tell everyone I'm not racist. Uh, I, I I see Rodney King get beaten up on TV, and I go, ah, that's too bad. Right, right. And I just leave it at that. Well, yeah, it's too bad. I mean, I'm not racist, everybody. I mean, just so you understand, I, mean, I would never beat someone like that. Right, but right. see, that's that's where people. It's get unfortunate, themselves. but I'm not doing anything about it. All I'm doing is declaring. You know, this create this safe zone around myself to tell everyone else, "Hey, I'm not like that." The problem is h- how you say it. Okay. In other words, not everybody is going to go out and do something about Rodney King, but you got to realize how wrong that is for somebody to do that and be willing to say that. If you're in a neighborhood, if a white person lives in a neighborhood and they don't allow black people in there. That they just don't, they, and mm-hmm. you and your your answer to that is well, I'm not the person that's keeping them out, right? But you're also not the person letting them in, right? Exactly. So you gotta you gotta do something. You gotta make a you gotta do something that says that lets everybody know that I'm not this way, right? Just not, just saying I'm not is not enough. Yeah, you have to say. Uh, family X wants to move into the neighborhood. I'm going to do all I can and get them in here. That, that's what. That's the difference. Saying it. No, well, I'm not racist. I'm not gonna. I'm not the one keeping this family out. No. The next move is to get them in, moved in. Yeah. Without everybody else moving out. Right. Because we had that. Oh yeah. But we still have that actually. <laughs> uh. Fortunately, it hasn't happened in my neighborhood, but it, we do have that. Right. Well, they're still waiting to see if your friends will move in or not. Yeah. <laughs> <When we> move, <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to help us at all. Yeah. You know, it, was, it, it was it was funny because when we first moved into where we are now, I guess it was mostly white. Uh, it's now about 50-50 it's six, or 60-40 or whatever because it's still mostly white. But the people that move in here can afford to live here. Right. That's where class comes in. Right. Uh, where they say, you know, if you if you can spend the money for the house, uh, you're going to take care of it. Well, you must be a good black person. Well, you know. <laughs> but, if you, I, but if I see you elsewhere and I don't know you're that good black person who can afford to live in my neighborhood, right. you're just a black person. Yeah, there's there's a book yeah. about that. I forget the name of it, but a guy that went to work for it in one of the country clubs, and the guy didn't recognize him because now this is a guy that worked in the sperm. Well, it's Hank Thomas, and, and he didn't recognize. Was I really? I didn't know it happened to Hank. An ordinary hero was my first award-winning documentary. It's about the life of my mother, Joan Trumpower Mulholland, and her participation in the civil rights movement. For most of us, our mothers are heroes because they're mothers. And mom is just mom. But when your mother's a civil rights icon, and yet you never really knew it, things change. Go check out An Ordinary Hero and find out how choosing to do what was right instead of what was easy helped change the world. You can find it on Amazon Prime or visit LokiMulholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection.
Yeah, well, Hank, you know, Hank owned those uh, Marriott hotels. Right, right, right. So he was, uh, yeah, he told us this story back in 2011, the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Ride. So he was, uh, so, because, you know, we all stay at the Marriott, right? Right. And uh, that was because, you know, Hank pulled some strings and got some good discounts, I guess, or whatever. But um, so Hank was telling us the story where at one of his own hotels, so he's there and a customer came in uh, and handed Hank the bags as if Hank was the bellhop. Wow. And the manager freaked out and Hank just went along with it. It's like, hey, this is a customer, you know, <laughs> right? Wow. Like, you know, and of course, the customer, when the manager, you know, was like, oh, you know, was trying to play it, they had the, you know, you know to explain things and I apologize to Hank. The customer, you know, was chagrined and, and Hank was like, hey, you know, uh, it's, you know, you're, 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 it's, your, it's your money and, uh, you know, and I want it. So, you know, I don't mind taking your bags. Right. Well, that was Hank's way of handling well, a very racist you know, yeah. situation because, I mean, was the guy trying to be racist? No, but he made this vast assumption that, he well, this is a black right. guy. So clearly he right. he takes well, bags for a living. That's what happened at this country club. The guy was waiting tables. He was, And the guy just never recognized because he was out of place. Mm -hmm. It was not we expected to see him. And that happened. That has happened to me. So I... It ain't gonna happen. It won't happen in my neighborhood because I know most of the people here, white and black. Right. But it does happen in other neighborhoods, where uh, because you're black, you're not supposed. It used to happen to Ann all the time because our daughter mm -hmm. is is is, uh, is mixed race. Because my wife is white, and she used to go out with Belinda, and she would take her places, and people would look at them, and in their mind, they couldn't get it straight because. Now, if Ann had been black, it would have been different. Right. When the kid white, that's different. They expect to see that. Hmm. But they used to they used to stare at Ann, and then they look at Belinda, and they couldn't quite get why they were together or why Ann seemed to be in charge of this girl. Right. Because white women don't do that. Right. You know, but it was if it was a black woman, it was all right. That still goes on, and that goes on even where I live. Well, that's, our societal that's our societal perception of roles and so forth, exactly. which is based on race because it's, you right. know, well, you know, going all the way back to, yeah, I mean, going all the way back, right? The more we learn about being black in America, mm -hmm. the madder people are going to get, and they're going to make mistakes as well. Sure. But they're looking, I don't want anybody, I get angry about it, but I don't want Anybody who's white making up for what something that somebody else did, I just want them to recognize that I may be, uh, I may respond to that, sure, or or that may be like the statues, you know, that's right, that's, right. that's, that's an example of it. Sure. And I understand that you don't know, you've been told that that's your history. All right, that's your history. So let me tell you what your history is. Right. Uh, I'm gonna tell you the other part of it, but. We, we we come up in this society where people are just getting angry, angrier and angrier because I'm learning more about what all the riot, well, I know a lot about it, but people are learning more about all the riots that took place. Mm -hmm. So they're blaming all the white people. And uh, I think that's just as wrong as uh, white people blaming the black male because he happens to look like somebody that's going to do something to him. Right. Because he's tall or because he's big or because he's whatever. Right. So it, it, we got a long way to go. But I do think that the white person can help us to get there. My simply, simply, I mean, it's not complicated. Just be uh, uh, willing to learn and willing to be a part of. That that's all. Right. So don't don't allow your your declaration of not being racist be the end of it or a shield. Right. Um or, the, next you know, thing, the next thing should be is I'm gonna fix this. Right. You know, just be aware of it. Don't let people get away with it. When the people say things, you say no, that's not what that's not true. Right. Not on an individual level. But on a, on, a, on a global level, you say this. Not all black people are going to do this, are going to mug you. So stop thinking that way. 
Right. Uh, that guy came in the store, and the cheapest thing in is sixty dollars. Let's say, mm-hmm. I don't know what what's expensive, but so obviously that person is not coming in this store to hurt you. Recognize you know, that. You don't know if that's expensive, sixty dollars. Yeah. How rich are you? No, how rich is Westchester? Oh yeah, man. I'm like, <laughs> hey, Levon, <I'm> like man. <laughs> Was that, that's that the price of a candy? Is that a price of a candy bar out there? Sixty bucks? You're no, like, I don't know if that's expensive get, or not. No, but if you go in a store to right. buy a shirt, I think it's going to cost what, fifty dollars. Is not a lot of money. It depends on what store you go in. You go in Nordstrom to buy a shirt. 50, can I hold fifty bucks there? To, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll get it right yeah. out to you. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let, you know, accept the person as a person as opposed to a black person or a right. white person. Right. That's not what they are. They're just, they're just people. And by the way, it is perfectly human for the white person to want to hold on to something that he thinks you're going to get from him. Mm-hmm. So if you go a job, for instance, uh, if you're qualified, and I'm, you know, if, if a white person is qualified for the job and I'm qualified for the job, now chances are, the white person is going to get it, but maybe the white, the black guy gets it. Right. Well, well, I mean, take a look at that statement that I, that was that we made earlier about equal rights. Um, that let's jump back to my pages here real quick, but uh, you know that that's well. The, the, well, the term is always okay. So when asked if the country has gone far enough in giving blacks equal rights. Well, giving, I mean, it's already there in the Constitution. What is, what is this giving stuff? So because if you once you use that term give, it means you have to take. Right. Recognize so, is a better word. Right. Right. To not recognize give. their rights, not give, because, yeah, again, instantly someone goes, well, if you're, you know, and it's this loaded language instantly. Yeah. Because well, clearly, uh, rights are finite, and uh, you know, we uh, if you give if you're going to give blacks rights, and that means you're going to take it away from me. That in and of itself is, is racist, because right. th- there was a time in history that they had to do that. That mm-hmm. white America had to do that. They had to. Well, write they, had, a, they, had, they didn't have to. Didn't have to give. They had to share. No, they had to think about what the Constitution. Did not have, had right. we were I, three quarters of a human being. Right. Right. I hear you. I, I know where you're right. going. Right. And then they had to write the anti slave laws. And then they had to write, you know, uh, voting 13th, rights 14th laws. and 15th Amendment. Yeah. Exactly. So, yes. I let's get, but so that's, that was, they had to give that. Give back. It, the, the, I'm about to say, yeah, because Jim Crow, I mean, all of a sudden now you have to give it back. Right. Yeah. Well, once they did that, so there's no longer a give. There's a there's a there's a there's a uh, a recognition of right I fair have as access much right to, to as you. They, yeah. right yeah, right yeah which is which is all most people you know if if everybody had done what we were trying to do in the sixties we'd be just fine because all people were asking for was to be a part of life in America right I mean people volunteered to go to the army people I mean come on. But you want that, that that will not happen today. I don't care if you're my friend or not. I, I just want my rights. That's it. That's it. That's it. And that's what the 60s was all about. That's what the 50s were all about. Part of the 40s were about that. Yeah. I'm not I'm asking you to give me anything. Just get out of my way and let me do it. Allow, allow me I, to I, live my life. Right. I'm willing to compete. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll compete with you. Just let that happen. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's all. That's all we were asking for. Now people are asking for more, right? But so, want a great way to help a worthy organization and educate children about the civil rights movement? Visit our foundation, the Joan Trump Hour Mulholland Foundation, at the jtmfoundation.org. That's the jtmfoundation.org. We are a five hundred one c three established to help end racism through education. A $5 monthly recurring donation will provide curriculum for 30 students. As my mother used to say, I can't do everything, but I can do something, because doing nothing is not an option. 
If you have wanted to help in this cause, but didn't know how, now you can. The Joan Trumpower Mulholland Foundation at the jtmfoundation.org. So, coming back around at the end of all this is, it's not enough to say, I'm not racist. You need to go out and, and do something about it. Yeah. I mean, even, you know what? Even if you don't go out, even if it comes to you, mm-hmm. even if you hear a joke. If it comes into your house. Oh, joke. Yeah. I, 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 let me tell you a story about a joke. So I was at, uh, yeah, I'm out here in Utah, right? And uh, went to church um, and, 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 and at a different, so I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And our organization is, is so when we go to a church uh, building, it's, we call it a ward, which is a geographic area. So my neighborhood is a ward and okay. multiple wards equal a stake, right? And so when someone goes off on a mission, they typically have what's called a missionary farewell in their ward. Okay. Now, my wife's sister's stepdaughter uh, is on a mission right now. And her farewell, she's actually in the Ukraine, you know, serving this mission. And so we went, we live in Lehigh, and we went about 20 miles out to somewhere in South Jordan, um, you know, in Utah. So we're visiting this ward. And uh, oftentimes you'll have a, a youth, a youth speaker. Okay. So someone who's 18, you know, younger, you know, 17 or younger, who's, you know, giving a quick talk about some gospel principle of faith or whatever else you have an adult speaker and, you know, and so forth. Um, and then you also have, in this situation, you would have the missionary speak. Okay. Um, so the first person to speak, and then you have sacrament, you know, that's blessed and passed and so forth. But, um, so the first speaker was a youth speaker. And this girl is telling this story about how they got stuck in the desert in this car and, uh, you know, and they prayed and so forth. And when they finally prayed, you know, help came and so forth. And it was actually a really faith affirming story, except for how she started it, because she lost me completely the second she started. So she starts, we have this car. We call her Shaniqua because she's black. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're in church. Right. Um, Everyone laughs, except for me and my wife and, and Janiqua. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Shaniqua. So, because everyone in the in the congregation is white, right? And, but oh, everyone laughs, okay. and which is affirming this. Right. I'm, I'm I'm getting ready to get up and leave, but I'm going. Okay, look, I'm visiting. I'm not here to make a scene. Um, you know for my, you know, my, my wife's family and so forth. Cause her mom's there. I don't, I don't want to deal with the in-laws in this fashion. Right. So right. I'm just going to play it straight and just, you know, listen, I'm going, okay, I'm going to use this story sometime later. So here I am using this, but, it, it, but I, I started to think about this. So one is this validation, right? The whole congregation laughs, which reinforces this girl's idea that this was all yeah. okay. Yeah. Clearly the family felt this was all okay because I mean, a lot of people name their cars, right? But they, they they saw nothing wrong with the idea of giving a black car a black name. Right. Right. Shanique was a very black name, right? Right, right. Um, so, so, yeah. So, so in their house, they're probably going, you know, they just got this car. What are we going to name it? Oh, someone says, oh, I know. Let's name it Shaniqua. Everyone laughs in the family and it sticks. So, yeah. It, 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 you know, in this idea of saying, uh, I am not racist, that's the opportunity when it comes to you to say, hey, wait on, wait, wait a second, guys, you know. But when everyone else around you, you know, you have to have that courage to stand up, even in your own family, when that comes. It requires a lot. But if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. Because yeah. clearly... It's not just enough to say I'm not racist. You have to be against it, and you have to right. be willing to speak up against it. I think so. Yeah, and we have to be willing to teach and have that opportunity. Uh, you know, to 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 reach out to people and go, hey, you know what? I, I find this offensive. This is why. I mean, this is you know. So I, my my foundation, we do. Uh, you know, we exist to end racism through education, 
Um, and we provide, you know, this, you know, educational material about the civil rights movement and so forth, you know, your stories in this and, 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 you know, we have the films and such, but, uh, it's so important to get to the youth, but for me, it's so important to get to the teachers. Yeah. Oh, well, yes. Cause if you can impact the teachers, look how many more kids you're going to impact. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is. But give them the tools you know, which hopefully this podcast is one of those tools, but give people the tools to have, to understand why it's wrong and what to do about it. And right. like, uh, I think it was you in an ordinary hero said, my mother chose the courage of her convictions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She was exactly. willing to, to exactly. stand up and stand out, not stand right. back. Right. Right. Takes a lot of courage. Yeah. But uh, I think that's, we need a lot of that. Yeah. We need a lot of that. Well, thank you, Levon. Appreciate it as always. And, uh, you know, stay safe and, uh, yeah, you too. keep up the good fight. Thank you again for listening. Make sure you head to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Loki Mulholland. Show a little love if you can and get access to even more content. Until next time, don't be afraid to get uncomfortable.